Okay. Cool. So, you guys ready? So, just one more time for the people who are not here. They're going to watch this video later. Monday, uh, there's going to be no instruction, no algos. You guys can come in. Um, I may or may not be here. So, if in case I'm not, um, if you have any questions, feel free to slack me. Um, um, and also next week is project week, right? Think about a project, uh, a good kind of scope for the project to be something that you can do within a couple days, right? Like the, the, um, the Bitcoin thing I made, that was like very, very close to the scope of like a project week project, right? Something simple that you can build out very quickly and then you can use the rest of your time to kind of polish it up, right? And make it better. Okay, so who's gonna take the exam on Friday? Thursday. Okay. Thursday. 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 So there's some people to tomorrow. Okay. So the thing is, if you take it tomorrow, you can't take it on Friday. Wait, 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 wait. I thought we, I thought we talked about this. <laughs> well, unless you want to do it, but the thing is, these exams, I need to grade them, right? So I need to be here when you finish. And if you take it like at night or something, then it's it's very difficult. It's not official, right? It won't be official. Yeah. What if I know I failed? <laughs> well, yeah. If if you don't want to submit it and you're like, okay, I just want to take this as practice, then that's yeah, yeah. fine. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. And then you could take that same one again. You can't take this. I'm not gonna. <laughs> well, no, I'm gonna, like, gonna give okay. you. I'm gonna give you a code, and it's gonna be different for each day, right? So. So he he's taking it as a, as practice tomorrow. Or I might today? I might take it today oh, okay. as practice. Oh, okay, never mind. And then maybe it'll be taken on Friday. Okay. okay. If you take it as practice today, I can give you the same one that I gave to the others. Okay. Yeah. I, can I decide halfway that I don't want to practice? <laughs> no, well, the kidding. thing is, there's <laughs> only four exams. Yeah. I can't be giving out an exam no, for I'm every person every day. Yeah, yeah. Then all the variations would be you know, yeah. uncovered, right? Um, so if you want the one that they did on Monday, then I'll give that to you. Yeah, you can look yeah, at I'm, it. yeah I'm not going to submit it. I'm just going to... Yeah, practice. just take your time and just work through it. Okay. Yeah. So let's just say um, like, if I want to take the test today, but after like the sports day or whatever, is that too late? Since you said you no. get the what if I did that today and then another one tomorrow if I didn't submit the first one? And then a third one Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not right. Friday. Well, we'll talk about this later. All right. It's, it's being recorded. recorded. <laughs> so, okay. So, I want to talk a bit about NS predicates. And we haven't really talked about NS predicates. It's basically like um, in SQL, you have like these SQL syntaxes where you can select, you know, select the uh, entries where the age is like above 20 or something right you can define these parameters for your search in core data so far all we've done is just we've gotten everything from an entity right using using ns predicates you can make those filters right and i wrote this for a reason because here in this link this is ns hipster website right and I didn't even know the mustache did that. <laughs> but if you look at this link, it gives you some really good uh, some reading about how to apply predicates. You can, uh, you can apply predicates to arrays. So if you have an array of a bunch of stuff, you can only you know, get the predicate to filter out the few you know, things that you want. You can also do the predicate with the uh, core data query. Right? So when we fetch all from core data, that function, we can write a predicate to it so that it only gives us certain things. So what I want to show you is the to-do list assignment. And what we're going to do is we're going to only fetch the things that are not done. Right? So that, that would be useful. Right? So let's take a look at the to-do list project that I have. Right, we got intermediate notes. <laughs> to-do list. I'm just going to copy a version of that over here.
Okay, so I have a few things in here. Let's add a more another thing. Okay, so I got three things in here. One of them is checked. I can uncheck it if I want to. So let's say I'm gonna check this uh, another thing, All right? So these two are the ones that are incomplete, and this one is the one that's complete. So if I'm gonna add the NS predicate, let's take a look at what I need to do to use NS predicate with core data, All right? Fetch request has a predicate property, All right? So when we create our NS fetch request over here, in the function that's called get all data, I'm creating this constant called item request, and that is an ns fetch request. So if I wanted to add a predicate here, I would add it in the predicate property of this item request dot, and if I type p, I see there's predicate, right? So I'm gonna have to add that here equal to something, right? And I'm gonna comment this out for now, and let's see what we add to the end of that All right so let's say there's a, there's basically like a ton of ways you can define your predicates um, I think the easiest way is this one with the format so you make an NS predicate and then you you know the argument would be the format so I'm just gonna copy this one all right, so here we're gonna we're gonna define the predicate before we set it. So I'm gonna say, and it's good to name your predicates more explicitly. So I'm gonna say checked checked predicate is an NS predicate object format is going to be this is the name of the property and that's the name of the value, right? So here we're gonna look in our core data to see the property over here the attribute I named it checked, and then the type is a boolean, so it's gonna be true or false, right? So we're going to call this checked and then this is going to be equal equals to false All right so once we have that predicate made let me see if this is yeah i think that'll work so there's all these different types of things you can, you can do to create that predicate now let's add that to our item request okay so now if I run this if there's no errors it should fetch me only the unchecked ones so there should be two of them that I get you want check yeah, you want check <clears throat> oh okay well I'm gonna check these two and then I'm gonna run it again There we go, right? So the two checked ones are not shown because the NS predicate filtered it out. So you can filter out things, um, you know, it's very similar to the syntax you did in SQL where you're like select this and that, right? Um, there's also another, uh, there's another kind of um, like a filter request for like um, NS, NS filter, I believe. So once, once it's checked, it, like, it's outside of the database, like it doesn't exist anymore? No, it's in the database. You're just not getting it from the database. It's not sure. You're just ignoring that piece of data and getting okay. the pieces that you want. It's very much like the, the SQL. When you're, it's all in your database, but you're only retrieving the ones that you want. Right. So I think there's a... Um, if we do... Let's do this. And I want to show you this, and I didn't show this to the last cohort. But I think, you know, it's good to know as well. So I'm gonna comment out this this NS predicate stuff. So we're not gonna search for the, you know, depending on which, whether it's checked or not. But what if I wanted to find these things in, you know, the order of their date or something, right? I don't want to like filter it. Rather, I want to sort it, right? So I see here we have one that's May. These two are April, right? So Let's go ahead and try to sort this based on date. And I don't exactly remember how to do that. Sort uh, fetch or sort uh, re 
request in Swift 3. Cool data sort descriptor. Okay, it's called a sort descriptor. All right, so this is the one that we want. And I believe sort descriptor, yeah, this one, this one looks better. Okay, so you know what I'm saying that like there's a curveball in every one of these you know, kind of exams, and the, really the curve of the ball depends on how fast you can Google it, right? So if you can Google it that fast, then it's not really a curveball, right? So let me paste this here. Selection sort descriptor, I can call this date sort descriptor, and a sort descriptor is key, and the key has to match the one in your thing that you named it, so it's date. So here we're just going to put date, ascending is true. And then we're going to add that to the item request. Dot sort descriptor equals an array of these sort descriptors. So I'm just going to put this one in here. And I actually used this when I was building the, the cryptocurrency app because you want, I wanted to sort the, the things based on like how expensive they were, right? So it looks like we got the April ones first and then the May ones. What if we did false over here? Let's see if it changes. There we go, changed. Right, so now the one in, in May is on top. Right, so you can do sort descriptors for sorting the, according to different properties, and you have the link for the NS hipster um, NS predicate stuff over there. Okay, any questions on that? Pretty straightforward, right? Good. So I want to quickly go over a Grand Central Dispatch. It's uh, one of those things that is really interesting technology. Um, you're not really gonna have to like do anything too sophisticated with it. A lot of it is just already built and just for you to to kind of you know use. So it's basically you know in a in a big picture kind of way. It, it goes down to you know how fast your device can process data, right? So you have your GPUs and your CPUs. Right? CPUs are very good at process processing single things one at a time, but very quickly. So it's like a machine gun that just shoots super fast. The GPU, on the other hand, it's multi-threaded, meaning that it doesn't process thing, single things very quickly, but rather it can process things slower, but all together. Right? So it's like shooting like an array of handguns all at the same time, rather than a machine gun very quickly. That's kind of the difference. So when you're processing graphics and stuff, GPUs are really good. They need to simultaneously render all this crazy stuff, right? But you're processing things in an event loop, like for your app, right? You need to, these things need to be done in order, right? They can't be like all simultaneous because the code is processed linearly, right? So that's why CPUs are, you know, so valuable, right? The thing with the, you know, the CPUs nowadays is that there's, you've heard of like, you know, quad core, dual core, you know, I believe the iPhone has like two or four cores. And there's also a separate like standby core that only runs when it's standby. So the reason why they divide these powerful CPUs into multiple cores is because, what do you think it is? Why is that? It's a very practical reason. Well, isn't it so that they have different functionalities and different ways of processing the, uh, the, the uh, CPU so that you don't end up, like if, if something is like loading in the background or if you have to go back? Well, you can do, you can achieve concurrency with a single core. That's not, I don't think that's the main issue. Um, there's software out there like Grand Central Dispatch that will handle concurrency, like doing things asynchronously. Um, it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But the idea is, um, if the reason they, there's multiple cores is so that you can save energy. If you have one core, it's going to be on or off. And then if you have to calculate like something simple, it'll be boom, like the core is on and then your battery's dead, right? So they have these cores divided out into like different units. Like one core is significantly more power consuming than the other ones. So that when 
you know, you're doing normal things, the other one might be on. And then when you're processing images, for example, the other, the main core will be on. So it's very sophisticated hardware. Now, back in the day, you know, developers had to write custom code to say, hey, you know, use this core, dispatch this piece of work to there, and then this, you know, and there was this thing called thread safety where if the cores are processing things concurrently, then if you don't manage it well, when they try to like merge back into the main thread, it'll cause like this inconsistency that will like crash your app or something, right? So it's called thread safety. And before the developers had to manage that themselves. Now there's this thing called Grand Central Dispatch. And what it is, it's just a piece of very, very sophisticated software that Apple developers have wrote that interfaces with the kernel of the, the device. It, it's like hardware level interfacing. So it actually knows when to open up different more cores, when to open up more threads, how to manage this piece of work in the most efficient way possible. Right? And a lot of that is just, we don't even interfere, we don't see it. It just, it just happens under, you know, behind the scenes. So the way that GCD kind of, um, in a nutshell, there's, there's always gonna be a main thread, the main queue. Okay, so the main queue is the priority between all the dispatch queues, right? So you've seen that you know there's dispatch queue.main.async. That just means that you're merging whatever it was that was on the dispatch queue back to the main queue, right? So the main queue you can think of it as the uh, the first class or priority line in the airport, right? So whatever is there gets done right away. That's always going to be open. Every other dispatch queue is kind of like the economy class where people kind of have to wait for the main queue people to, to leave before they can go in, right? So when you do the dispatch queue.main.async, you're moving those work, workers on the line of the dispatch queue to the main queue so they get priority access, right? If you don't, they're still gonna get in, but they're gonna get in at some later arbitrary time whenever the main queue is open, right? So if you want faster UI, the only thing that you guys need to do is to remember if the UI looks slow, then dispatch queue.main.async will generally fix that, right? So the UI has the main queue, the priority, because you always want the app to be responding to users you know, in their interactions, right? That's what the UI stuff is, right? So yeah, Apple wizards do magic. That's the, the takeaway. So I wanna show you guys this video, and we do have some time, so I'm gonna only show you guys the first like 15 minutes of it. And it's basically, it's this video from the uh, the developer conference in uh, WWDC 2016, and that's when they introduced this Grand Central Dispatch, the new update for that. So this is straight from the horse's mouth. This guy is gonna explain, you know, what it kind of does. talk to you this afternoon about how to structure your program with concurrent programming and what we've done this year that's new in GCD and Swift 3. My name is Matt, I'm going to be joined later by Pierre, and we're both on the Darwin Runtime team here at Apple. So when you create a new project, you're going to have something that looks a little bit like this. You have your application, that application gets its main thread. That main thread it's responsible for running all of the code that powers your user interface. As you start to add code to your application, you're going to find that the performance of your application changes quite drastically. For instance, if you start to introduce large items of work, say data transforms, data transforms or image processing on your main thread, you're going to find that your user interface suffers drastically. On Mac OS, this can be the spinny wheel appearing. On iOS, 
It could be something more subtle, your user interface will slow down, or maybe even stop entirely. So I'm going to take you through some basics on how to structure your application to avoid this kind of problem. And later on in the talk, Pierre is going to come and take you through some more advanced topics. So how do we deal with this kind of problem? <clears throat> we have to start by introducing the idea of concurrency to your application. Concurrency allows multiple parts of your application to run at the same time. On our system, you achieve concurrency by creating threads. A CPU core can execute one of your threads at any given time, but the payoff for introducing concurrency, the penalty for introducing concurrency to your application, is it's much more difficult to maintain your thread safety. The other threads that you've introduced can observe the effects of you breaking your code invariance while you're performing operations on other threads. This becomes a bit of a problem. So how can we help? Well, GCD is the concurrency library on our platform. It helps you write code, multi-threaded code, that works on everything from an Apple Watch through all of our iOS devices, Apple TVs, and all the way up to a Mac. So in order to help you with your concurrency, we introduced some abstractions on top of threads themselves. That is, dispatch queues and run -ups. A dispatch queue is a construct that allows you to submit items of work to that queue. In Swift, this is closures. And dispatch will bring up a thread and service that work for you. And when <coughs> dispatch has finished running all of the work on that thread, it can tear that worker thread down for you. So, as I said before, you can also create your own threads. And on those threads, you might run run loops. And then finally, on the first slide we saw, you get your main thread. And the main thread is special. It gets both a main run loop and a main queue. So dispatch queues have two main ways that you can submit work to them. The first of which is asynchronous execution. This is where you can queue up multiple items of work to your dispatch queue. And then dispatch again will bring up a thread to execute that work. Dispatch will one by one take items off that queue and execute them. And then when it's finished with all the items on the queue, the system will reclaim the thread that it brought in for you. <coughs> the second mode of execution is synchronous execution. This is where, for instance, if we have the same as setup as we had before, the dispatch queue with some asynchronous work, but you have your own thread, and that thread <coughs> wants to run code on that queue and wait for it to happen, you can submit that work to the worker, the, to the dispatch queue, and then that thread will block. It will wait there until the item that you've asked to execute is completed. We might add some more asynchronous work to that queue, and then dispatch will bring up a thread in order to service the items on the queue. Again, the asynchronous items will be executed there, and then when it comes time to run the synchronous item that you've asked to run, the dispatch queue will pass control over to the thread that was waiting, execute that item, and then control of the dispatch queue will return back to a worker thread controlled by dispatch. It will continue to drain the rest of the items on that queue, and then also reclaim the thread that it was using. So now I'll show you how you actually submit work to dispatch. How do we use that to help us solve the problem we had earlier? Well, what we want to do is get the work off your main thread that's causing, it, causing you to block your user interface. And we do that by taking the transform that we had on that main thread and running it on a different queue. <clears throat> so you can take the transform and you can back it with a dispatch queue. And now, when you want to transform data, you can move the value of that data to your transform <clears throat> code on the other queue, transform it, and then send it back to your main thread. This allows you to perform that work while the main thread is idle and servicing events. So what does that look like in real code? Well, it's really simple. So first of all, you can create the dispatch queue to submit your work to by just creating a dispatch queue object. It takes a label, and that label is visible in debugger as you're writing your application. Dispatch queues execute the work that you give them in first in, first out order. That is, the order that they were submitted to the queue is the order that dispatch will run them. And then you can use the async method on your dispatch queue to submit work to that queue. 
So now that we've actually submitted our resize operation here to a different queue, well, how do we get that back to the main thread? That's very simple too. The dispatch main queue services all of the items that you execute on it on the main thread itself. This means... So, I'm going to stop there. All right? This is pretty much the extent of what we're, what, what we are going to be interfacing with, right? So you can create a separate queue, put all your stuff in that queue, do the work over there, and then when you want it back, you do the dispatch queue that may not async. Now, when you do um, API requests, it automatically puts it on dispatch queue. That's why you need to do this to move it back, right? Um, yeah. So when we did the core motion stuff. In the starter kit, you'll notice that we did this this code here. I said let q equal to my some q, and then we we ran the the run loop of listening for the changes in, in the accelerometer in that run loop on the separate q, so it doesn't block up the main thread. Right. But this this stuff, you know, it's good to know. Um, it's really kind of mind blowing that they they thought of all this and like they they built it in a way that's like so invisible. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's all I got for the Grand Central Dispatch. Let's quickly talk about um, today, you know, the end of goal bucket list. Um, basically, it's everything in advanced section. If you don't get to the end of that, don't worry too much about it. I would prioritize your time with studying for the exam, which is some people do tomorrow, some people do Friday, but I compiled a list of for sure concepts that you need to know. And there are table views, segs, passing data between the view controllers using prepare for seg. Protocols and delegates will be will allow you to run methods on other objects that you need to delegate the task to. You can also pass them data through the function arguments. Right? Um, don't forget to set the variables that you create. So if you make a delegate and then in the in the you know the second view controller you are, you're like var delegate is of type something something delegate you need to immediately after you make that variable go to the point where you're setting that to make it not nil because if you don't set it it's going to be nil and when you run that function with the question mark it's not going to run because it's nil right i've seen that many many times right so always just try to you know cover your bases and set it right away um, custom cells another one if you want to, you know, study custom cells, look at the Ninja Gold demo. That is uh, the prime uh, demo for that custom cell stuff. Um, and also core data, which is pretty straightforward. Um, that's going to be an exam. I think core data is worth like three points on every exam. So data persistence is a big one. Um, when you do the exams, there's going to be a rubric that tells you how many points are, um, what the different features are worth. Typically, the curve wall will be worth two points. So my recommendation is try to get all of the, the easy points first. Get all the easy points, like if I'm going to add something, make sure you can add it. If I'm going to edit something, make sure you can edit it. And then once you're done with all that, like work on the work on the, the extra stuff afterwards. So guarantee yourself an 8 and then reach for that 10. Right? Is 8 a run? Yes, 8 is pass. But there's no partial points. So it's like the feature works or it doesn't work. right? So it's we're going to approach this. Um, in a way that's kind of like, um, you know, a client comes to you and asks you to build an app. You build it, you show it to them. If the feature doesn't work, then they don't care, like, you know, to what extent does it not work, right? They want to know if it works or not. So it's going to be really quick grading. Um, and, you know, I don't think it, it'll be that hard. So as long as you know the, the basics, you know these things, then it should be a you know, walking park. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if you know the basics, the only extra thing that's unknown is how long it'll take you to Google that curve ball, right? And if it takes you to Google like you know, five minutes, then that's five minutes. So, but the thing is, prioritize the, the main points first. Go for the, the curve number. Are we allowed to use the method that you were talking about the other day instead of sex? Yeah. If you can make it work, then it works. So, we're not really going to go in and try to like dig, dig around your code because. With iOS, it's really about there's no end to how optimized your code can be. Right? So if it works, 
that's great. I mean, given four and a half hours and get something to work, that's good enough, I think. So, you know, the same follows for your project. You know, build a couple days, get it to work, and then spend the next three days trying to optimize it. Cool. All right, I'm going to stop this video now.